Okay, so good afternoon everyone. So let's start uh, this uh, afternoon session with a second lecture by Raju on the color glass condensate. Okay, so um, I, um, I'm going to take, uh, take off from where I left off yesterday. Um, and I'm going to um, tell you about um, an effective theory called the color glass condensate. Um, and I have to explain all the words in this title to you. Uh, and that's my goal in this talk. Um, and um, uh, there's going to be a set of lectures next week by Edmond Yanku. Um, and he's going to go into uh, some of the things in, in much greater detail that I can ever hope to achieve. Um, and so uh, the way to think of this is kind of, a, again, an overview uh, of some of the topics that are relevant. Uh, and um, I'm going to actually, the motivation here is to prepare you for my next two lectures, which is the main topic of my, uh, well, or the main objective of my lecture series, which is to talk about a first principles uh, description of thermalization in heavy ion collisions. And this discussion here is essential for what comes in the next two lectures. So uh, I'm not going to go into great detail into the effective theory itself. Uh, you'll hear some of the details in the talk by Kaushik, Ray, uh, Kaushik Roy tomorrow. Uh, it's in, in his uh, student presentation. But you will certainly hear about it in much greater detail uh, from Edmo. So without further ado, um, let me remind you what I talked about yesterday. Uh, I talked about um, what I call the frontiers of our ignorance. Uh, and I did it in the context of deep and elastic scattering, where the two parameters that you vary are Q squared, the resolution scale, uh, and X, uh, where, which you can think of as, as the wavelength. Uh, and, and 1 over X is proportional to uh, the parton density. Uh, and so as you go to smaller and smaller X, you go to higher and higher parton densities. And what I try to... Um, mentioned yesterday is that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. And part of my talk was a motivation for a future machine, the electron ion collider, uh, which we hope to have built in the United States in the next decade. Uh, and I hope all of you will be interested in the science uh, and one day contribute to it um, efficiently. At least that's my part of my motivation for, for being here is to get you interested and possibly excited uh, about this uh, new machine. Uh, that has the potential to be transformational in some way. So, um, but again, I, I want to sort of focus on this landscape that I mentioned. And, and um, there was a famous clown in the US, and he kind of formulated things in terms of known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns, and known unknowns. Uh, and, and so um, there's, uh, these are the sort of known knowns in, in, in the strong interactions, QCD. Uh, which is, um, I don't know, no one laughed when I said famous clown, but okay, so um, the, the, um, the, the, what we know in, 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 uh, in QCD is perturbative QCD. Uh, and as, as we discussed, it's precision phys physics for very large Q squared, rare processes, you know, Higgs top, Z bosons, and so on, um, jets. Uh, and also, uh, there are a lot of weak coupling techniques that have been developed at finite T and, and at finite chemical potential, uh, which you heard to some extent in, um, in the talks by uh, Peter Petretsky. Uh, and then the other corner that we understand in QCD is lattice QCD. Uh, and again, Peter gave a beautiful um, set of lectures on how it provides uh, quantitative description uh, of many features of static properties in QCD. Uh, and then there's chiral perturbation theory, which, uh, sorry, um, which sits in this corner here. Uh, it's it's uh, very non-perturbative physics at low energies. Uh, and that uh, tells us it's, it's also QCD. It's an, it's an effective theory of QCD, which is exact in some limit. Uh, and it tells us about the proper low energy properties of meson and baryon interactions. So these are things that we know very well. But as I argued to you yesterday, that 
that's only some fraction of the total landscape of the strong interaction. So cross sections and so on are not necessarily dominated by these regimes that we understand, but there's a vast uh, amount of physics that we don't fully understand. And what I'm going to do today is going to zero in on this part of the, uh, of the landscape here, which is very high density gluon matter. Okay. Uh, um, but before I go there, I want to also talk about known unknowns, okay? Uh, so what, what is it that we don't really know very well in QCD? Uh, and that's a lot, actually. We don't know the, how to describe from first principles the bulk of elastic and elastic and diffractive cross sections. And sometimes it's euphemis euphemistically called soft physics, uh, even though it can include scales of a few GeV. Um, so it's, that's sort of the scale of softness. Uh, we don't understand how partons fragment and hadronize. We know how to parameterize these in black boxes, like I was saying. Uh, but we don't really know how to really calculate that from the theory. Now, uh, there are lots of you know, models, um, stringy models uh, specifically. Like, they go by these names. These are event generators, Pythia, the dual parton model, AMPT, EPOS, and so on, which parameterize successfully a lot of data. So a lot of the soft physics that's produced, for example, at the LHC is fairly well parameterized by this. And they capture you know, fairly, you know, you know, at some level, uh, the key features of the underlying theory. But they're hard to really motivate from first principles from the underlying theory. And they constantly have to be retuned when there is some new piece of data that shows up. So you have to really think of them as as a way to just parameterize the bulk of the data that you see, rather than afford some deep understanding uh, in terms of the underlying theory. Okay. And what I mean by that is they cannot really be derived in any limit from QCD and require lots of ad hoc assumptions and parameters, especially when you apply it to extreme environments of very high temperatures and densities. So what is it that we need to understand uh, to make progress in some of these known unknowns. Uh, and so what would be nice would be to construct an effective theory, which is as closely as possible motivated and related to the underlying theory, okay, which can describe the varied phenomena of multi-particle production. Right? So when you have proton-proton you know, collisions at the LSC, you produce lots of particles, um, and most of them are soft. And we would like to somehow understand uh, you know, how that happens, right? And what is the underlying physics that controls that? What are the nature of the correlations? Um, in heavy ion collisions, it's even greater, right? You produce thousands of particles. Uh, and how, how does that happen? How does that occur? So that's something we would like to understand. Uh, and the basis of any good effective theory is that it should smoothly match to the fundamental theory in appropriate kinematic limits. So the idea of effective theory is that you use it in regimes where it's very difficult to calculate in the fundamental theory, but then it should match to the fundamental theory in some limits. Okay? So that's uh, the, the, that's the sense uh, in which you can really call it an effective theory. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this in, 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 in my talk. And in fact, I'm going to construct at some level such a theory. Um, and this theory that I will construct has much predictive power. It provides an efficient and systematic description of deep elastic scattering, hadron, hadron, and heavy ion collisions. And part of the purpose of my talk is to give you a flavor of how it does that. Uh, it's going to be hard uh, in these few lectures to go into in too much detail. Okay. Now, even though this has a lot of predictive power, it also has its limitations, like any effective theory. Uh, it's least effective and the physics is, is sensitive to the infrared scales that govern chiral symmetry breaking and confinement. So, so like I mentioned yesterday, that that is really the outstanding, these are the outstanding problems in the strong interactions. And this is, there's no magic wand that's going to wave that away. So when you get to a regime where these are important, you better start to worry, okay? Uh, whether what you're doing is reasonable or not. So, uh, to come to where I'm going, uh, the, so as I mentioned yesterday, the proton, and hopefully the one takeaway 
uh, or one of the takeaways from my talk yesterday should be that the proton is a complex many body system. Okay. Uh, that it's not just three valence quarks, but at very high energies, it can fluctuate into states which don't just carry three quarks, but large numbers of gluons and quark antiquark pairs, the latter being called C quarks. Okay? So you can think of the proton as sort of fluctuating into different configurations with different lifetimes. And there are very short-lived configurations which the proton fluctuates into, which contain large numbers of these partons. So the proton then is a many-body system. And it lives for a very short time, okay, this fluctuation. However, if you have a probe that's energetic enough to probe it on those very short times from the uncertainty principle, right, then that probe will see the proton as this many-body state. Okay? That's the idea. And that's the essence of this plot. And I'm going to keep coming back to this in different ways, uh, but that's what this plot tells you is that you have a fluctuation of the proton as represented by these parton distributions as a function of x, which shows that at very high energies, the, the gluon distributions are very large and they grow very rapidly, and they are carried along by these uh, C quark distributions when you have a fixed momentum resolution of 10 GV squared at very high energies. Now, how do we understand this a little bit more um, uh, less heuristically? So if you think about what's going on, so you have some uh, virtual photon produce some quark antiquark pair, and that starts to um, emit gluons. Okay? And so you can think of this as a ladder of gluons that comes from the quarks that couple to the photon, which in turn comes from the electron that's the scattering of the proton. Now, if you, if you do a simple calculation in perturbative QCD, the first thing you'll notice is that each of these rungs of these ladders has a phase space factor uh, when you square the amplitude, which goes as the dKt squared or Kt squared times dx over x, where this is the longitudinal momentum fraction uh, that's carried by this, this parton that's emitted, and Kt is its transverse momentum. So longitudinal fraction and transverse momentum. And then there's a factor of alpha s when you square this amplitude. You have g here and g on the other side. Uh, from the complex conjugate amplitude, you get a factor of alpha s. Okay. So, if, so this is basically, so from each rung of the ladder, you get alpha s log x times log q squared, roughly, if I integrate this up to q squared, um, and from some x naught. Okay, so, so this tells you something very interesting, which a lot of people actually don't think about when they hear about it. Uh, in QED, something like this would be very unlikely. Okay? And the reason in QED it's unlikely is that in QED also a photon that's exchanged can produce quark-antiquark pair or electron-positron pairs in that case. Right? But there the factor is the alpha electromagnetic. Okay? Alpha electromagnetic is very small. So you have to go to very, very high energies for these phase-based logs to compensate for the alpha electromagnetic. So in QED, you cannot have too many emissions. Okay? Um, so, so they're suppressed by powers of the coupling. However, in QCD, alpha S is not particularly small. So if you are at sufficiently small x or, or large Q squared, and it doesn't have to be too large, these logs compensate for alpha S. So there's no penalty factor for emitting more and more gluons. Okay? That's very different from in QED. And when you talk to condensed matter physicists, this is important to keep in mind because when they think of correlations or something, they're just thinking about you know, one or two emissions here. Here, we're talking about a whole ladder of you know, large emissions. Okay? Now, when you compute in per perturbation theory, you can just write down the Lagrangian of QCD. You can write down the Feynman rules and compute diagrams. So you can compute diagrams like this. Okay? Now, in principle, as you go to high energies and high Q squared, there's lots of rungs of the ladder, and there are lots of ways to attach gluons to the rungs of the ladder. Uh, and so it's arbitrarily complicated. However, if you are in the limit of very large Q squared or very large X, then you can do some ordering of the diagrams in a particular way. Where So if you're at very large Q squareds and X are not very large, you can look at diagrams where the, where the momenta of the partons are ordered in KT. Okay? And that 
so those would give you the largest contribution. So, so if x is not very much different from x naught, but q squared is much greater than q naught squared, then alpha, the, the, the terms in your graphs, in your perturbative QCD graphs that come with alpha log q squared being large are enhanced. So you can, you can consider all the other Feynman diagrams as being subleading. Okay. Uh, and so if you sum up those graphs, that's what gives you the DGLAP equation. Okay. So the DGLAP evolution consists of keeping a strong ordering of the, emit, the, the emitted partons in, in KT, okay, so KT1, KT2, and so on, all the way up from the proton ordered uh, up to Q squared. Uh, and if you, if you actually write down the corresponding equations that describe how, when you add further rungs, this, this, the, 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 the uh, cross sections change from these Feynman graphs, that's what will give you the DGLAP evolution that you heard about from Michael Spiro's talk. Okay. Now, what he didn't talk about was that there's another kind of ordering, which is, happens when you go to very small x. Okay, so suppose x is very small. So you're going to the very high energy limit where you have parton fractions which are very, very small. Okay, 10 to the minus 5, say. In that case, these logs are very large, and they can, in principle, be larger than these logs in Q squared. So then you're keeping an ordering of all your Feynman diagrams, you're organizing your, all your Feynman diagrams in such a way that you keep terms which are leading alpha log x. Okay? And when you do that, there's a similar kind of renormalization group evolution, which tells you how things change when you add one more gluon to each rung of your ladder in the cross sections. And that's something called the BFKL equation. So DGLAP stood for Dokshitsa, Gribal, Liparov, Altarid, Parisi, while BFKL are four Russian physicists, Balsky, Fadin, Kuraev, and Liparov. Uh, and so, so they wrote down an equation for this evolution in the mid-70s. Uh, and and uh, that is sort of the paradigmatic equation uh, for QCD at very high energies, uh, as, as I will further describe. So both DGLAP and BFKL give you very rapid growth of gluon distributions as you go to high energies, okay? as I'll describe. So, so let's now focus a little bit on the two limits, right? So, let's, so, so I mentioned here that you have the limit where you take Q squared very large and you keep X not so large, right? Or conversely, I keep Q squared fixed and I take X very small, right? So um, these limits are very powerful ways of organizing one's thinking about what happens in perturbative QCD. And in particular, uh, the limit where you take Q squared very large in the limit of very high energy. So S is the central mass energy squared. So if you take a particular limit, so you say you write down your Feynman diagrams to compute some process in, in, in QCD, in perturbative QCD, Okay, and then you say, okay, let me take the kinematic regime in my Feynman diagrams, where Q squared is very large and S is very large, okay, so the center mass energy, but I keep X, which is roughly Q squared over X fixed. Okay, so this is called the Bjorkian limit in QCD. Uh, it's sometimes called the Bjorkian Johnson low limit, okay, because they were also thinking along these lines, but Bjorkian really very effectively applied it to describe deep elastic scattering. Uh, that's why it's just called the Bjorkian limit more often than not. And this is the limit of QCD where perturbative QCD really shows its power. Okay? So it's the limit where you can define the operator product expansion, factorization theorems. Everything that you heard in Michael's talks are all problems formulated in the Bjorkian limit of the theory. Okay? And um, that's very, very, and as you saw from Michael Sock, it describes a lot of very interesting things uh, at the LSC and elsewhere, uh, and, and previously, so it's, this has really been a very powerful way of organizing one's thinking in QCD. And in fact, you know, this is, uh, in, 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 the, in the Bjorkian limit, if you think about deep elastic scattering, so this is a little more uh, detailed, in detailed version of what I wrote previously, where you have a virtual photon, split into some quark-antiquark -quark pair, which can then radiate gluons uh, all the way down to the proton. And in perturbative QCD, you can break down this 
this, uh, this whole computation of these n, uh, n body gluon ladders and so on into two parts. One is the part where, which is the actual vertex of the interaction of the virtual photon, uh, which is called the coefficient function. And you can compute that systematically order by order in perturbation theory to very high order. Likewise, when you have these, these rungs of these ladders, right, the probability to emit a parton from a rung is called a splitting function that's denoted by this p. And at each, at each rung, you can expand the splitting functions into powers, okay, I mean, of, of the coupling as well. And so when you organize your perturbative QCD series, as you saw from the lectures of Professor Spira, is that you can do very high order computations and coefficient functions for any given process that's process dependent. But then there are universal uh, splitting functions which you can also compute to very high orders in perturbative QCD. Okay. And the Mellon moments of these splitting functions are the anomalous dimensions of operators that he was talking about. Okay. Uh, and, and these are universal quantities in QCD. So in addition to this, though what he did not talk about in his talk is that there are so-called higher twist contributions to any process. Okay? And these higher twist contributions in the Bjorken limit are justly ignored because they are suppressed by powers of Q squared typically. Okay? So if Q squared is going to infinity, you can ignore that and this formulation becomes exact. Okay? And so so in the Bjorken limit, it's completely justified to ignore these higher twist contributions uh, typically. Uh, but once you start going down to smaller Q squared, okay, this, is an, this is an unquantified systematic uncertainty in any perturbative QCD calculation. Okay. So when people apply perturbative QCD to scales of say one, two, three GV squared, Right? They are on perilous ground because they have systematic uncertainties which they can't quantify. Okay? Because these higher twist operators are something that they don't know how to calculate. And that's one of the, uh, one of the issues there in this, in this. But if you're working jets of hundreds of GeV or with, with producing Higgs or the top, okay, where you have a very large scale in the problem, you can justifiably uh, ignore these higher twist contributions. So what is this, so we can write down lots of diagrams and calculate things, but what is the intuitive picture of what the Bjorken limit means, okay? And again, I find that this is something that's unfamiliar to a lot of people, at least the, having a picture in their heads, uh, and that's why I've, I've drawn this like this here. So what does it mean to go to the Bjorken limit, okay? So imagine you think you have a hadron and having your, your three partons, okay? Uh, think of them as your valence partons. And now you increase Q squared. So like I said, when you open up the phase space in Q squared, you, you, you enhance the probability to have more emissions because there's no penalty factor, right? There's no suppression because each alpha is, comes with a log which is roughly the same size, right? So, so there's no penalty. So what happens when you increase Q squared is that you produce more and more partons. How do the number of partons grow? they grow roughly logarithmically in Q squared. So as you increase Q squared, the number of partons are proportional roughly to log of Q squared. It's actually a little higher power than that, but it's roughly log of Q squared, very high Q squareds. However, the phase space density of partons, that is the number of partons per unit momentum, per unit area, okay? That actually, becomes smaller, okay? And the reason for that is that the log growth in the number of partons will never beat the suppression that you get by one over Q squared, okay? So as you go to very, very high Q squareds, you are increasing the number of partons in your hadron, but they are smaller and smaller, okay? So the proton as a whole is actually becoming more dilute, okay? So when you have a high energy collision of two protons, right, at very high Q squareds, the objects that are scattering are very small and very far separated from each other in phase space, okay? So that's why it makes sense to think about just one body distributions, 
Okay? You don't have to think about you know, the correlations between these partons and the wave function. They're just like one body distribution. So you can factorization in that picture is intuitive. Okay? Because it's just, you know, the product of these, you know, the probability for each of these objects to scatter. Because the likelihood that one of these guys scatters simultaneously on two of the partons is very small, right? That's suppressed. You have a question. By transferring more and more Q square, we are basically creating or probing by it creating more and more quantum QCD particles, which are basically UDS. Uh, well, up quark or down quark, but they are structural. So how I can say that my face space is somehow, so you just talk about that they are small. So what is the, this small mean? So first of all, I mean, most of the partons, you're, so you're not changing the flavor content of the proton when you do this, right? The flavor, uh, so, so the... So there will be only exactly, up and down. So the way you do it is you increase the number of gluons, say, right? So you will increase the amount of color charge that you would see, for example, right? But, but, but so what? I mean, so the number of these quanta is, is increasing, right? So the phase space density, well, so in this case, the phase space density actually goes down, right? Because it's suppressed by one over Q squared. So what I mean is that, so think of, think of, you know, you, so in quantum mechanics, what you see depends on how you measure. Right? No object has an existence independence of a measurement. That's the first thing you learn. So when you, when you probe the proton at a given Q squared, you're going to see a certain number of quanta. Okay? And if you probe it at a higher Q squared, you're going to see a different number of quanta. Okay? What this theory tells you is that those quanta that you see at a higher Q squared, there's more of them, but they're smaller. Yes, exactly. This term smaller means I'm not getting it. Smaller means the resolution is 1 over Q squared. Okay, okay. So in terms of wavelength or something like that. Well, I mean, the, the, the typical area that you resolve is, is, I mean, in quantum mechanics is one of the resolution scale. You know, we don't have to forget about quantum mechanics when you're thinking about quantum field theory. So, I mean, it's the same, same idea. So, so now, if you say, okay, I believe in factorization, Right, and then I say this idea of what the parton, what the proton looks like when I resolve one of them should also hold when I scatter two of them, right? Then it makes complete sense that you can ignore all these higher twist contributions at very high Q squared because these objects are really separated in phase space from each other. So the collision of any two of them doesn't is is not strongly correlated with the with the other guys. There's no overlap. So that's, I hope that's clear. Any other questions? Now, so the Bjorkian limit, as I said, is this extremely powerful uh, method for precision physics uh, in, in QCD. And it works great for inclusive high Q squared processes. But as I just mentioned, when you start going lower in Q squared, Okay, at some point, the phase space density is no longer so dilute, and there's problems that come in, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But besides that, when you start thinking about other kinds of physics, like diffractive processes, exclusive processes, and so on, or when you try to think about, say, nuclei, like I talked about yesterday, uh, when you think about partons going through the color field of a nucleus, for instance, and multiple scattering, uh, this formalism turns out not to be particularly well suited for that. Okay? Um, so it's not designed to teach shadowing, multiple scattering, diffraction, energy loss, impact parameter dependence, any kind of many body physics, so the problems of thermalization. So if you're interested in heavy ion collisions and you want to understand thermalization, the Bjorkian limit is really a straitjacket. Okay? rather than a liberator, okay? So it's, 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 a, it's, it's not designed to address these kinds of issues where you have lots of scattering or, or you have um, much more differential quantities that you're interested in studying. Uh, so, so that's one, one of the issues. Um, it just happens to be the case. It's, it has its regime of validity, uh, which, is, which is important to know, okay? 
However, there's another limit of the theory, which, um, which is actually older than the Bjorken limit. Okay? Uh, and and, and uh, that's why it actually goes under the name of Reje and uh, Gribov. Uh, I mean, Reje was older than Gribov, than Bjorken, I believe, and, and Gribov was probably his contemporary, or maybe a little bit older, too. Uh, and, and that's the limit of x Bjorken going to zero at very high energies, so s going to infinity, but now keeping q squared fixed. Okay? So the Bjorken limit was q squared going to infinity, s going to infinity, but keeping x fixed. But in this case, now you, keep, you have s go to zero, and x, uh, sorry, x go to zero, s go to infinity, and keep q squared fixed. Now, the, the rigid limit was, as I said, older than QCD. Okay? When people first discovered the strong interactions, Okay, they implicitly were working in this limit of the theory, and a lot of sort of the stringy pictures that came out about QCD, you know, in the sort of S matrix kind of formulation uh, that 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 owes uh, that that sort of started from them, like, uh, was in this limit of the theory. Okay, however, in those days the energies were not very high, and so the rigid limit could only be studied at very low. Q squared scales, where Q squared was on the order of lambda squared um, QCD. Okay. And so that was an intrinsically non-perturbative limit of the theory, and it was very hard to make progress uh, in the theory, even though people derived beautiful theorems about analyticity, unitarity, causality, and so on, which are still valid uh, in general in, in, in QCD, in the strong interactions. But what is new with colliders at very high energies is that you can, you can try to think in this asymptotics where s is very large, x is close to zero, and q squared is large but fixed. Okay? And this, as I'm going to argue to, is a physics of strong fields in QCD, multiparticle production, and yet to be discovered perhaps universal properties of the theory. Okay? Uh, and so if you want to address some of the issues that I talked about here, if you're interested in these kinds of problems in QCD, not precision physics necessarily, then it may be more effective to formulate your thinking about the theory in the, in the radial limit. So again, here's the same kind of cartoon that I have. Uh, and, and let me reemphasize that s goes to infinity, q squared is fixed, where x goes to zero. Uh, and so again, you can think in terms of Bremsstrahlung. But now what happens is that something very different happens, is now you're keeping Q squared fixed, so you're keeping the momentum of these partons fixed, but you're increasing the energy. So when that happens, you are, when you, there's no additional suppression in your phase space density, right? In your phase space density, you had a one over Q squared, which was getting smaller and smaller as Q squared went to infinity. But now if you keep Q squared fixed, that's not changing. So then you just have the growth due to whatever logs that you're adding up, right? So in the Bjorken limit, in the numerator, you had the logs of Q squared, which was growing, but then it was suppressed by one over Q squared. So as you took Q squared infinity, that, that ratio went to zero. So that's the phase space density going, getting small. In this case, you're keeping Q squared fixed, right? But you're still increasing the number of partons because you have a large phase space at high energies, which allows you to emit gluon, so you get these alpha log x uh, contributions at each rung, so you can have lots of emissions. So what happens then is that the phase space density becomes large. It's not getting smaller. So think of, you know, again, your proton like a jelly bean jar, like I was saying the other day, right? And so now you're starting to put more and more jelly beans in your jar, okay? And they're all the same size. They're not getting smaller and smaller. So when you have jelly beans all of the same size, at some point, they start to feel each other, okay? And, and these jelly beans carry color charge, right? Quarks and gluons both carry a charge. So you're adding charges, and they start to interact very strongly. And this now begins a very interesting many-body problem, okay? Where you can have two soft gluons, okay, recombine to form. So this is now you have a hard gluon which is emitting softer and softer gluons here. But you can have now the reverse process. If there are two soft gluons which are close to each other, 
they can recombine and form a harder gluon. So you can have the reverse process. Instead of a hard guy just splitting softer and softer guys, you can now have two soft guys combined to form a harder guy. So there's a reverse process going on, okay? They can also be screening, so these color charges can screen each other. So there's many body effects due to the screening okay, that goes on. And so here's a quote uh, by Frank Wilczek in Nature where he is describing this problem and he says, uh, in his usual evocative manner, he says a fascinating equilibrium of splitting and recombination should eventually result. It is a considerable theoretical challenge to calculate this equilibrium in detail. Okay. Now, a lot of people try to understand this process as if it were like the Boltzmann equation. So if you've studied you know, kinetic theory or sc uh, scattering, right, you, you have a gain term and a loss term, right? So you have a gain term when, when two guys will sort of go into a large number of guys and you have a loss term and those can recombine and form into your initial particles. Uh, and so you can think of it as two opposing things, and then you have thermal equilibrium or chemical equilibrium, and the two kind of match each other, right? The two gain and loss terms match. This is actually, even though it seems that way, the, the, what actually happens is far more complicated. So someone asked me yesterday that how do you know that you, know, that you actually get these net and repulsive terms? Um, and it's actually very non-trivial how that occurs, okay? It's very intricate many-body physics that occurs. So it's a combination of screening, recombination, uh, with together combined to give you a net depletion of the number of gluons when you go to high energies. So it's a very non-trivial process. But in this framework, it can be understood straightforwardly. So, so this picture that I had here, sorry, um, was, is you can think of this as a ladder in energy, right? Or in X and Q squared, so in phase space, okay? Now, if you think of it, again, in terms of the proton coming at you head on. So imagine you're a probe, right? You are a QQ bar pair. So think you're sitting on top of a QQ bar pair and the proton is coming at you, right? Uh, so in that case, what does the proton look like? It's low energies, the proton's coming slowly, you're going to see your three valence quarks and a few other partons. But then as, you, as the proton is boosted more and more, you're going to see them fill up this jelly bean jar. And at some point, as I said, these gluons are going to start closely packing each other. And at some point, the occupancies, the phase space occupancies, become very large. They can become as large as 1 over alpha s. Okay. If they become larger than 1 over alpha s, the state is unstable. Okay. It will decay. Okay. So if you try to increase the occupancy parametrically beyond alpha s, you have an instability in the theory which will cause this to relax down to, to 1 over alpha s. Okay. So parametrically in QCD, the largest occupancy that you can have is of order 1 over alpha s in the theory. Okay. And so when the occupancy, so suppose you are starting a process at some Q squared, okay? And then you start, so imagine you are sitting on top of a quark. So you, you are sitting on top of a quark, right? And you have a certain Q squared. You have a certain resolution with which you're looking at the proton. So you have a little microscope there and you're looking at the proton that's coming at you. So initially at your Q squared, you see like three partons. And then you start seeing four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, blah, blah. And at some point, you're starting to see that they're forming these bigger blobs because they're starting to overlap. Okay. Uh, at any given Q squared, there is an X value at which the occupancy will become one over alpha S. That Q squared as a function of X, at that X value, that value of Q squared where you find occupancy is what is called the saturation scale. And that's when, for that given Q squared, the proton becomes completely packed, okay? It's a close packing radius or inverse radius. That's the scale Q squared. And this scale is an emergent scale in the theory. So it's not something that you could see from the Lagrangian or depends on the nature of the, uh, on the it's sort of, it's, it's on the, pro, depend, on, the, on the nature of the probe. 
It's something that's intrinsic to the theory, and you can think of it as being generated from the fundamental scale of the theory, which is lambda QCD. So it's somehow some souped up version of the scale, lambda QCD. So it's lambda QCD times something, some power of energy, right, where the power is something that you can calculate in, in, in QCD. Okay. Yeah. This gives me time to take a sip of water. <laughs> Just now you said that uh, if you're sitting on a Q square, first of all, uh, in the initially you will say that there will be three quark, three uh, hadron, three quark, uh, three quarks. When it uh, keeps coming closer and closer, then the number of uh, particles increasing increases. But the number of particles that should depend on the energy of the proton, not on the distance between, or not on the relative energy between a particle which is seeing the proton, isn't it? No, so, 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 so what I'm saying is, imagine you you are a quark anti quark pair at rest, yeah. right? Okay. So you're sitting at rest, okay. right? And then the the proton is coming at you with higher and higher energies, yeah, right? And so when it's coming at higher and higher energy, so suppose it was initially at some lower energy, right? I, you know, I'll, I'll show you a picture a little bit later on, which I hope will make this clearer. Okay. The energy is increasing. The energy. I thought the energy is constant. It's coming with a constant energy, and then how is it? No, no, no. So you're, you're sort of you're increasing the energy. You're boosting the the, the proton okay, with, higher and higher energy. Okay. With the, with respect to the uh, quark, right. anti quark. So think of it as being accelerated. Okay. Right. So so when you accelerate, so think in of charges, right, in QED. So that's a good way to think about it. So think of charges and they're being accelerated, right? So when they accelerate, they can emit Bremsstrahlung. It's exactly that, okay. okay? In fact, it is the exact analog of up to this point that I drew here. I could have done this exactly in QED, okay? Except these will be electron-positron pairs, right? But, but I could have, you know, I could have lots of radiation. I could have Bremsstrahlung, right? When I, so I have an electron going, it's accelerated, it emits Bremsstrahlung. Accelerating, that's why it's dependent on X. Right. Okay. I have a question. Uh, so when you are now introducing a saturation scale, should not we now can relate not this? introducing it. My claim is that it, it, it is emergent. emergent in the theory. It's so it's not related to the temperature. So we cannot associate a scale like a temperature till now. Um, because but, you already have many body interactions. So... Right, but but so this is uh, so this is a, a very interesting question at some level, which um, which you know I, we can come back to later on as well. But um, so what you have is uh, you know it's it's this idea of you know open and closed systems. Okay, so here you have a hadron, which is a universe. Okay, so think of your hadron as the wave function having a wave function, which is like the wave function of the universe. And so when I'm here, I'm describing the wave function of the entire universe. So it's a closed system, okay? So it's a coherent state, okay? So in that sense, it's not clear what I mean by this in the sense of a temperature of the system, right? Um, however, if I coarse grain this object, okay, uh, in some way where I, uh, then one could possibly think in terms of something like, like a temperature. So, so there's very interesting issues having to do with entanglement and entanglement entropy and all of these things that come in, where you can still define something like a temperature in that context, um, maybe very relevant, but um, I, I, can, I would like to defer that to a separate discussion. Okay? But it, it's, a, it's a reasonable question to, to, to ask. Um, I mean, you can think of it, you know, something like, you know, when, when uh, so, uh, you know, in, in gravitational physics, you have something like Unruh radiation when you have, uh, when you have um, acceleration, right? So, and there you can relate that to a temperature. And perhaps that's what's motivated your question, okay? Um, so where the acceleration can be thought of as the temperature, okay? Um, and so in, in that sense, there may be a possible analogy to thinking along these lines. But it's not a trend. Temperature in the sense of being a thermal system in the usual thermodynamic. Uh, I I have, so uh, 
we understand a Björken limit because I mean Q square is not in our hand. I mean, it's a it's an emission of the particle which is spontaneous. It's not something that we can control. One has a control on the any I mean center of mass energy. So you can accelerate the particle to certain energies. No, no, no. Q uh, squared is an external. It's an external variable, right? It's a it's a property of of. So if I'm doing a deep elastic scattering, right? It's an external variable. It's the angle at which the electron is scattered, right? So it's like an electron comes in, it's scattered at some angle, right? Q squared is the you know sine four theta over two, right? Of that of that object times some scale. Okay, yeah. So I was trying to understand the physical. Phys I mean, physically, how do I see it? So, so, so essentially, what you're saying is that you focus your attention at a fixed angle so that your Q square remains fixed, right? And you exactly. go into the asymptotic uh, collisional energies, right? So, exactly. if if we do that, then we have this uh, phenomena of saturation coming in. That's right. So, so um, you you can uh, so there's, so this. Right. So this, it's, it's a, you, I think it's really, I mean, that's one way to certainly think about it, and it's a, that's a reasonable way. Um, I mean, the other is you can really think of it, you know, just in general. You don't have to think of it in the context of deep plastic scattering, necessarily. Uh, it's just this idea that you have a probe that's resolving the hadron at very high energies, right? And if the probe is small enough to see color, right, as you boost the proton relative to it, you will see this phenomenon. Okay, of saturation. So you, you can, this phenomenon is also valid in, say, hadron hadron scattering, for example. But I think deep elastic scattering is a very good way to start thinking about this problem. Yes. Uh, if we talk about the resolution, then in that case, uh, the discussion you just had a few slides back that the density goes smaller and I mean, so one has to, fi yeah, one has to fix it at a small exactly. angle, specific angle then. Exactly. Yeah. So th exactly. that's why I was saying. Exactly. But, you know, the thing is that, so this is, uh, so so I did make a statement which I will rephrase, where I, where I said, you know, well, of course, you know, physics depends on the measurement, right? But one can formulate, and I will come to this in a little bit when I construct the color glass condensate. One can think about this in a completely different way. I can think about this as being a property of the wave function, okay? I can take QCD and I can write down the wave function of QCD. I can construct the number operator in QCD, or, or I can construct moments of the number operator if I like. And on that basis, I can define a phase space density entirely on, in the wave function alone, which is related to the scale. And so then I've constructed the wave function, and then I can convolute this wave function with some wave function of a probe. Okay. The two descriptions should be completely equivalent, right? Because the physics shouldn't depend on how I do that. But I'm saying that you cannot divorce this from saying that this is also a property of the object that you're saying. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, you can also construct the whole discussion in terms of a property of the hadron. And I'll come to that and hopefully that'll be clear. And so these are really touching on some of the most profound questions in relativity and quantum mechanics, which come in together in quantum field theory. So when you get to the radial limit of QCD, all of these subtle fundamental questions that you always worry about in quantum mechanics and relativity, they all come to the fore. And it, things are very counterintuitive sometimes. Okay? So, so, but you're asking all the right questions. And, and we'll uh, see, hopefully, more to jog your imagination as we go along. So, uh, but coming back to the original picture, so, uh, so let's think of a first a simple model before I go towards constructing this theory. Uh, let's think of a simple model where, uh, again, I have this electron which emits a virtual photon, and that splits into some quark-antiquark -quark pair. Okay. Now, the quark carries a fraction z of the momentum of the virtual photon, while the antiquark can be thought of as carrying a fraction 1 minus z of the momentum of this incoming virtual photon. And the quark and the antiquark are separated by a distance r perp. Okay, so that's their size, relative size, uh, which is roughly proportional to one over q. Okay, which is q is the mo momentum transfer being carried, the momentum of the virtual photon, the four momentum. So this cross section for this process, where this object now scatters of the proton, 
So you can think of this as a representation of all the color inside the proton, say in the Ray J limit, right? It's a very dense object. Is a convolution of the probability of the virtual photon to split into a quark antiquark pair. So that's this object here. So this psi TL, this is transversely a longitudinally polarized photons. Uh, because they are off-shell, right? Because the, the, the photons are not on-shell real photons, so they can have both transverse and longitudinal polarization. Um, and this, is, this wave function is a function of R perp. It's a function of this function Z, and also Q squared, which is the momentum transfer from the electron squared. It's a convolution of the probability to split times the probability of this QQ bar pair to scatter up the proton. And that's this object here. So I've taken a problem in deep elastic scattering, and I've transferred that to a problem of something like hadron-hadron scattering, right? So this, this is a cross-section of this small hadron. My QQ bar is a small hadron, which is now scattering of the proton. And this object is now a function of R perp that it sees and the relative energy, that is this x between this object and this here. So there's a beautiful model, very, very simple model, uh, which is constructed by Georg Kuna and Ristoff. And it's, it's called a dipole model because obvious, this obviously is a, is a kind of quark antiquark dipole. Where they said, oh, let's make a very simple parameterization. They were trying to understand the data which was from Hera. So remember that propaganda plot that Michael Spira showed and that I showed where you see the Hera data in X and Q squared, you know, this big, many orders of magnitude. So they were trying to understand that data, okay, in this picture. And they said, let's make a very really dumb model, okay, for this object. Let's assume that it has some fixed cross-section times one minus some survival probability where that's proportional to R perp squared, which is this transfer size of this QQ bar, times this new object, QS. Okay, let's introduce this saturation scale here. And this scale is now dependent on X. And they said, let's parameterize the saturation scale by some scale which is, uh, which is a confining or infrared scale, Q squared, times one over X to some power. So they had these three parameters here, and sigma naught, and they said, okay, let's see if we can understand the Hera data with this, okay? Completely out of left, you know, because people had been doing all these DGLAP fits and so on, you know, very, very sophisticated stuff, and these guys did the dumbest possible model you can imagine, but it took a lot of cleverness to do this dumb model uh, where, you know, this QS is something that is now X dependent. And it turns out, Surprise, surprise, that all the Hera data in X and Q squared, you know, all that stuff on the propaganda plot that you saw, okay, for X is below 0.01. So that's very important. So if you put a cut in X, you're saying large X, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore, I'm going to only look at the data below X of 0.01. Okay, partons carrying a hundredth of the momentum of the proton. And they saw that all of that data lay very nicely on this log-log curve here, where an x-axis, again, this is a log scale, is the ratio q squared, but now divided by this new scale, okay, which is a function of x. And so, in general, there's no reason why this virtual photon-proton cross-section should lie on this curve. It should be all over the place in principle, right? In principle, x and q squared are uncorrelated. They're independent objects of the probe. Right? But somehow when you divided it by this QS squared, it just lay on the curve like this. Now whenever you see such a scaling, you, right, you should think, aha, maybe this is telling me about some underlying possible, fun, possibly fundamental physics. By the way, the data on this plot, most of the data is from the two detectors at Hera, H1 and Zeus. But uh, in this later plot, so this is a plot by Golik Pianos, Tasto, and Kwaczynski. They also put in data from fixed target experiments, E665 and NMC, and somehow E665 doesn't work very well, okay? But people have long suspected that this experiment had lots of issues. 
Uh, but all the other data kind of relies very nicely on this, on this curve. Okay? So this is telling you that, aha, uh -huh, you know, maybe there's something going on here. Okay? And people have, yeah. How do you get this formula, actually? This, uh, is there some, some motivation behind it, actually? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I will actually come to that, hopefully, if I get a chance. But, I mean, it's a very simple idea that you say that the, you know, you have some S matrix, right? Uh, so this is, the, this is the forward scattering amplitude, if you like. Okay? It's the forward scattering amplitude of the QQ bar scattering of the proton. And so that forward scattering amplitude is 1 minus the S matrix, okay? So our survival probability. Now we know from perturbative QCD, right, that for small r perp, this should be proportional to r perp squared. That's color transparency, if you like, right? The cross section is proportional to r perp squared. And the whole idea of saturation, and thank you for asking me this question, is that when q squared is, is when r perp squared q squared is larger than one, okay? Uh, in other words, uh, q squared is, greater than one over r perp squared, then this object goes to zero, okay, exponentially. And that's the idea of saturation, okay, is that at a scale which is not lambda QCD, okay, but a larger scale, right, the, the, the QQ bar pair is scattering of a black disk, okay, the, the S matrix, you know, going to zero is basically saying that this thing is not surviving. Right, the QQ bar pair, even though it's very small, is like hitting a black disk. Okay, it's going to get absorbed. Okay, and so this model built in these two limits. Okay, it built in the perturbative QC limit when R perp is very small, so that when R perp squared times QS squared is very small, you can expand exponential, and then and then this sigma is proportional to R perp squared. But if QS is, is much larger than one over R per squared, this goes to zero, and the cross section is large, okay? And look at this value for sigma naught. It's, it's 23 millibarns. That's the size of the, that's a hadron size cross section. So if it's like almost like a proton, we're hitting another proton, except in this case, it's a very small QQ bar pair, okay, in principle. So, so that's the basic idea. So, so there was really nothing more in their formulation. However, in the color glass condensate, in a particular limit, you can derive something, but there's an additional log that comes in here. Okay, that log is very important, but you can actually derive the generalization of this expression, which is consistent with leading order perturbative QCD in that limit. Okay. Uh, and so, anyway, so thank you for that question. Uh, but anyway, so the bottom line is that you saw this, now, it turns out that there are sophisticated dipole models that I don't have a chance to discuss, which give you a very good description of the small x data. So we have a bit of a conundrum, right? So Michael showed you that there is this machinery global fits in QCD, which gives you this amazing propaganda plot, right, which fits all this data. However, you know, someone like me could come and say, hey, you know, at small q squared, how do you know that your higher twists are not important, right? Uh, so perturbative QCD works and so on, but on the other hand, I have this description, okay, which also kind of works, and, and you can actually show that when you go to x greater than 0.01, it actually breaks down. You have a scatter in this, in this plot here. Okay? The problem with this picture at Hera is that the scales that you extract from these very sophisticated, well, no, somewhat sophisticated dipole models, much less sophisticated than what's done in perturbative QCD, um, is that the scales for QS that you extract eventually are quite, quite small. Okay? They're not much larger than lambda QCD. So you can say, do you really trust what's going on? Okay? So even though you can fit the data in this very relatively simple picture, which has saturation built in, you, what you're getting out are things that make you uncomfortable, even though it works. Okay? It's the same reason when you fit perturbative QCD at very low Q squared, Right? And you say, oh, perturbative QCD works, you should also be uncomfortable because you know that there are hard twists that you're ignoring. Okay? Likewise, this picture has this big problem here. Okay? And this is one of the motivations at the EIC, like I mentioned yesterday, for to go to nuclei. Because in nuclei, the virtual photons now scatter of a larger amount of color charge, okay? coherently, 
Okay, and this, so the QS can be significantly larger in EA collisions. And then you can really start going into the perturbative regime in Q squared, where you can start doing recoupling physics. Okay, so, um, so here you have to take a wild prayer and believe that recoupling is still justified. So there's no internal consistency for the HERA data, even though it works. Okay? But one could argue there's no internal consistency in perturbative QCD either when you apply it to very low Q squared. Okay? So this is the problem of small x in some sense okay, that uh, one, one is dealing with. Now, again, in the saturation picture, as I said, the cross-section goes as 1 over uh, Q squared or Q, uh, QS squared or Q squared, roughly, if I replace R squared by 1 over Q squared. And that's this curve here as a function of Q squared. And that's the total cross-section, right? However, if you remember yesterday, I briefly mentioned diffraction, where you have an electron coming in, it scatters of the proton. The proton stays intact, but then the electron blows up into a lot of particles. And that's hard diffraction. And that goes as 1 minus exponent squared. Okay, it's a very strong power, this. And the reason is that, if you think about it, it's two gluon exchange in a color singlet. And that's why you get a square here. And so this will give you a much steeper drop of the cross-section with Q squared. Okay? So if you were able to do diffractive studies at an electron ion collider, you could very quickly Okay, discern whether the physics is really coming from perturbative QCD in the usual sense, okay, of collinear factorization or this kind of physics, okay. Because it's very strongly A and Q squared dependent. And so when you look at final states, these are power law dependencies, so you should be able to separate the two out very quickly. So my claim is that on day one, quote unquote day one, of an electron ion collider, you should be able to really at least rule out certain kinds of saturation-based explanations, okay? You may not be able to prove it, but you could rule it out, maybe. Uh, and so this would be very interesting, okay? So at small x, diffractive cross-sections are very sensitive to nonlinear QCD effects, okay? So that's the other thing, right? When you go to the saturation regime, the phase-based occupancies are of order 1 over alpha s of QCD. It's highly non-perturbative. Right? You can never do simple perturbation theory and get a result which is 1 over alpha. Right? So it's intrinsically non-perturbative, even though the coupling is very weak. Okay? So, so this is a very interesting regime of theory where, the, where you can do recoupling physics, but it's non-perturbative. So um, uh, I'm running a little late, uh, but what I want to now talk about is actually Instead of a simple model like the Golic Peter, I want to just talk about actually constructing an effective field theory for this Rayje Gribal limit. So, this is the question I think one of you asked up here about how accelerating the proton, right? So, think of it the following way, okay? And this is really actually kind of neat. So, think of the proton, and I showed this plot again yesterday, but I never tire of showing it, which is at low energies, you have your three quarks. Right? So you're two up and a down quark. Now, even though you have these quarks, it's a quantum field theory, right? So there's constantly gluons which are fluctuating in and out of the vacuum, uh, you know, around these three quarks, right? So there's a quark goes along and emits a gluon which is absorbed by the other quark, or it emits a gluon and reabsorbs. So this is constantly going on, right? Our vacuum is constantly bubbling out virtual particles, right, in, in, in QCD. Uh, well, in any theory, this is particularly strong QCD. So now, say you're going to high energies, okay? So what's happening is that all these virtual fluctuations which are being absorbed, they start getting time dilated, right? Because of special relativity. So suppose you are a fluctuation, and then you're being boosted, so you're living longer and longer until you're reabsorbed uh, into the wave function. It's the same wave function. Right? This is the same proton as this guy here. So that's why, you know, thinking about it in terms of temperature is problematic. I don't know, some, you asked this question, right? It's exactly the same object, right? However, now, if you are probing at, at very high energies, the proton, okay, as opposed to low energies, because these fluctuations are living longer, you have a chance to see them. Okay? So imagine that there was a there was a quark that emitted a gluon and reabsorbed it very quickly, okay? 
if, you, if your probe was not fine enough, you would never see that fluctuation, right? You would just see the valence quark. But because you have time dilated that, you are uncovering those fluctuations. And that's the effect of the vacuum, right? So the vacuum is popping up these partons as you boost them, right? And, and when you have a very high energy probe, you can actually see these, these, uh, these, these partons. And, and so this is, this is actually, so the number of these, it's a kind of Markovian process that grows. Um, so you have gluons emit softer and softer gluons, and then you have this very rapid growth, okay? And so since it's Markovian, this grows an exponential of the, po the probability to emit one gluon that's given by this alpha log x. And the exponential of a log is, is a power law. And that's what gives you the BFKL equation, very simply. So this, this is a very non-trivial picture, okay? Because it really takes into account the fact that you're uncovering the vacuum fluctuations that address the theory. So another way of thinking about it is that your proton is a collection of Fox states, right? It's a Fox state which can be three quarks, or it can be a Fox state which is three quarks and 100 gluons. So it's not some static object, a classical object. It's a, it's a genuinely quantum thing. And so if you are able to, you know, strike the proton when it's fluctuating into these 100 gluons, that's what you're going to see. So now let's see if you can make a theory of those Fox states, okay? Uh, how do we actually construct? If I look at proton as a three quark bound state, if I Lorentz boost it, somehow I will get this higher Fox states? Yes. Yeah, yeah so, so imagine, I mean, in fact, you can think about this picture as I wrote it here, right? So all these, these gluon exchanges are what bind the proton, right? And so at low energies, you make constituent quark models, which involve all these bound gluons and so on, right? And you can say they even give some constituent mass, if you like. Okay. But in this picture, right, they're just quantum fluctuations which are dressing your proton. So now if I accelerate my proton or boost it to higher and higher energy, so I could start at minus infinity in a three quark state, right? And then if I evolve it, right, this proton is then fluctuating into various different configurations. And then I hit it, right? I have some interaction Hamiltonian, or hit this proton, right, uh, which will give me this, right? So the unitary evolution of the initial proton state at minus infinity right, generates this, this structure that you see here at some given time. And so that's the thing, right? So a lot of what you would think of as bound state physics at low energies, right, is manifesting itself very differently at high energies. And that's in some sense why you think when you study strong field physics in this regime, you're learning something really intrinsically non-perturbative about the theory as well. Okay. So, so here's my wave function. So now if I'm interested in the Ray J limit, I don't care about these fluctuations which are just three quarks, okay? I mean, people can do a quark model and study that. I don't care about that stuff. I'm interested in studying the proton at high energies. If I want to do that, then I want to focus on these wave parts of the wave function which contain large, large numbers of gluons. So I want to write down a theory for this component of the wave function. And that's this plot here, right? This is the fluctuation. The, this is the Hera plot, which I plot in a different way. So let's stare at this, okay? And this is what we did when we came up with this theory. We looked exactly at this plot here, okay? And what we saw is, hey, the valence quarks all kind of seem here, and the gluons seem here, okay? This is like the dumbest thing you can think of. And then you realize, hey, you know, these guys, they're like fast, right? They're moving really fast. I mean, that's exactly how I was thinking. You know, this is like moving really fast. So because they're fast, they must be like static on the light cone, okay? So they're moving, you know, close to the speed of light. And so they are, it's hard to deflect them off the light cone. So. So in the light cone, you can think of them as being basically stationary, right? So if you rotated your space, 
It's like you can think of them as being stationary. So these guys are kind of slow in the sense of being static. And these guys are fast, OK? So the small x gluons and C quarks are fast. They're fluctuating a lot, right? While these big guys are just sitting there, right? These heavy color charges at large x. So this is the essence of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Uh, so remember the Born-Oppenheimer approximation in, in atomic physics, right? You think of the hydrogen atom. And you can ignore the motion of the nucleus to first approximation when you want to understand the properties of electronic orbitals, right? You think of the nucleus as static, right? Because it's 1,836 times heavier than the electron, right? And so you just uh, think about the motion of this guy in the static thing. You can ignore that, right? And then if you want to construct corrections, you can do corrections in one over the mass of the nucleus of the proton. That's the essence of any effective field theory. So you heard um, Michael Spear talk about Applequist Corazon, and there's also Applequist Pizarski, I should mention, um, here. So Spear. what's that? I don't have a theorem. I think I have a theorem. Let's call it the Applequist Pizarski theorem, OK? At least in this room. Okay, that's we, we'll call it the Applequist Pizarski theorem in this room. Uh, you should be happy because Curzon left physics. So, okay, so uh, he didn't quite make it. So, but anyway, um, so, so this is the essence of the Born Oppenheimer. So, these guys are heavy static objects and these are light. Okay, so what you can do is to first approximation, you can ignore the dynamics of these heavy guys in the presence of these light guys. But this is QCD, so you have to be careful. You cannot completely ignore it because the heavy guys also carry color, right? And color charge. So the color charge will still keep interacting with the soft guys. So even though they, their kinetic energy is not important, right? The, the color charge they carry is important. So you have to be a little bit careful, but the essential idea is the Born Oppenheimer. So what I'm saying is that this is the essence of an effective field theory, is that you have a Born Oppenheimer approximation. Um, so let me just see, okay. Um, oops, I'm going too far ahead. So uh, before, yeah, so I had the slides in the wrong order. So in, in fact, this is not something just qualitative, and you can actually formalize the statement. And this was actually done as far back as 1968, okay, more than 50 years ago. Uh, where it was observed by Susskind and also by Bardaki and Halpern that the Poincare group on the light front, okay, that the group that controls, you know, translations, rotations, and boosts uh, is isomorphic, okay, is exact one-to-one -one map to that of the Galilean subgroup of two-dimensional quantum mechanics. Now that sounds uh, kind of abstract, so let's look at it in the sense of the simple thing, which is the dispersion relation, right? So for a relativistic particle in usual equal time quantization, E squared is P squared plus M squared, right? However, if you write this in terms of light cone coordinates, P minus P plus, so P minus is P naught plus PZ, sorry, P naught minus PZ and P plus is P naught plus PZ, right? And P perp stays the same. And you can rewrite E squared equal to uh, P squared plus M squared as P minus is PT squared over 2P plus. But that looks exactly like non-relativistic quantum mechanics, right? E equal to, two, e equal to P squared over 2M, right? That's the, the energy of a, of a non-relativistic particle. So you can rewrite the relativistic dispersion relation of a free particle in a way that looks just like it is that of a non-relativistic particle on the light front. So if you quantize your theory, not on a surface which is at equal time, but along the light cone like this, right, then that theory will look like quantum mechanics, okay? Where, with dispersion relations like that of quantum mechanics, okay, where E, where e is P squared over 2M in your denominators rather than, you know, E squared equal to P squared plus M squared, okay? So, the analogy of constructing this relativistic quantum field theory 
right, QCD on the light front is exactly analogous to that of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And so this Born-Oppenheimer approximation is exact, okay, in that sense. So large P plus corresponds to large mass, right, and that's this thing that I had here, right, so large, this is like large mass, so that's an exact analogy, and this is like small masses, right. So the large P plus modes, again, are static color sources, so which I'm going to denote henceforth as rho of A with the color charge here. And the small x modes are dynamical feeds, which are these gauge fields, m u of a. Okay. So now, let me go back and ask, what do these sources look like in the infinite momentum frame? IMF stands for infinite momentum frame. So imagine you have a nucleus which contains a lot of nucleons with lots of color charge, and I boost this to very high energies. Okay, so, you are, so say you are a nucleus and you contain lots of nucleons or lots of color and you're being boosted towards me. Okay? So what I'm going to see is I'm going to see you coming to me like a sheet, like a pancake, right? Einstein, right? You have Lorentz contraction. And so essentially the wavelength with which I'm going to probe you is going to probe along the radius of the nucleus a lot of color charge, right? The nucleus, which, is, which has a radius of eight, you know, eight to the one third, right? That nucleus to me seems like a sheet. Okay. So I'm going to see all the different color charges and all the different nucleons simultaneously. Okay. I can't distinguish the front end of the nucleus from the end of the nucleus because my wavelength is long enough that I can't resolve the two of them. And that's what happens at small x. In fact, you can in fact construct a condition here which says that the wavelength of a small x parton right, which is one over x times the momentum of the proton, is much greater than the wavelength of these valence partons, which is given by basically r over gamma, which is p plus over m, right, that's the Lorentz contracted size of this nucleus. That holds true when x is much less than a to the minus one third. So if this v parton is at small x, right, given by less than a to the one third, right, then it coherently sees all the partons from the nucleus simultaneously. So it's going to see a large amount of color, okay? It's going to see the color from the front end and the back end of the nucleus along its direction of motion. So this actually turns out to be very, very helpful in constructing such a theory, okay? So what, what Larry McLaren and I conjectured is that suppose you compute some operator at small x, Okay, it can be a current-current correlator, for instance, uh, in the ground state of the proton, okay? So you have the usual path integral in QCD, but we argued that in this limit, right, of small x, it's more efficiently described as, as the following decomposition. So here you have the dynamical small x fields given by the gauge field A, but now you have the static sources which is this d rho here, you have a weight functional which gives you the static distribution of sources, right? So because it's not, it, there's no kinetic term, it's just static. There's an action which is the usual QCD action, which is A here for gauge fields, coupled in a gauge invariant way to the sources, okay? So your, your action must be gauge invariant, right? And so you have to construct a gauge invariant coupling between the static sources at large x and the dynamical field at small x. So this is a construction, okay, of an effective field theory. And then you have this, these, whatever this operator is, is now a function of these sources at large x and the fields at small x. Now, when you look at this object here, the order in which you do these integrals is very important, okay? So because the sources are static, Okay, you have to do this integral last, okay? In other words, you first integrate over the fluctuations and then you integrate over the sources, okay? So this is very much like that in a spin glass. Okay? In a spin glass, you have this separation of scales, okay? Uh, between, 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 say, spins and impurities, right? And the separation of scales is actually what leads to the so-called famous replica trick, right? So you have many different copies of the same thing, 
which you're then integrating over finally over the distribution of copies. Okay? And this is the essence of this idea here, and that's why this is a glass. Okay? So color is obvious, right? Because these objects carry color charge. A glass is because of this separation of scales between sources and, and fields. And it's a condensate because these fields have very high occupancy, one over alpha s. Okay? So it's a very high occupancy system, which is analogous to that of a Bose-Einstein condensate. Now it turns out that this approach is an extremely powerful method to compute n particle correlations okay, in, in this limit of QCD. It's almost an exactly solvable theory. Okay? So I can compute I'm not going to pick up that telephone. <laughs> so, so you can compute all these different correlators, and the physics is essentially two-dimensional. Okay? Because you are at small x, right? essentially the longitudinal degree of freedom more or less decouples, and all the dynamics is entirely transverse. So the problem of QCD at very small x has been transformed to an effective field theory, which is almost two-dimensional. And in this two-dimensional theory, you can compute all n-body correlators. Okay? So it's very close to being an exactly solvable theory, even though it really isn't. Okay? So um, how do I actually, I, now here, I'm going to go through a construction which shows you that in this large A limit of the theory, okay, this, this construction has a self-consistency which is quite pleasing. So again, here's my partition function of QCD which is where this is now my QCD Hamiltonian, okay? And so what you can do is in the usual way that you go from a path integral, uh, you construct a path integral, you can insert lots of little boxes, okay, with your different quantum numbers. So N refers to your different quantum numbers, and Q is the color charges, which I've kept separate. Now, the problem when you go to a large nucleus, when you have a large amount of color charges, is that what you find is that if these color charges are not really connected to each other, what you have is a random walk in color charge. Okay? So this Q is constructed out of lots of the different color charges that your V parton couples to. Okay? And it's a very nice random walk problem okay, in, in SUN okay, that you can construct. And you can formulate this as a recursion relation in terms of these young tableau, where uh, you might remember from group theory that a triplet can be written as a one zero, which is in this form here, or an anti-triplet as, as something like this, right? Just either all rows or all columns. And so using this young tableau, you can construct more and more complicated representations, which are arbitrarily m and n representations, not just ones and zeros. And you can derive the following recursion relation for a given m and n, after you throw dice. So what's a random walk? So imagine you have a spin, right? So you throw spins, right? So you, or you throw dice, or you throw a coin, right? So it can be either one or zero, or plus half or minus one half. And so when you do a random walk on average, right, you will, you, on average you will be at the center, but then there'll be fluctuations which are proportional to the size, the number of times you flip the coin, right? It will go in one direction or the other. The random walk, the, the distance squared is proportional to the number of times you flipped the coin, right? If the, if the system is not weighted at all. So if you have an unweighted, so think of these quarks that the weak parton is coupling to as being random SU3 quarks. And then you're saying, what is the most likely representation of these quarks? Okay? So on average, you'll see zero color charge, right? Because they would sort of all add up to zero. But then you will see fluctuations. And those fluctuations you can actually compute by constructing such, such an explicit recursion relation. Okay? And then you can sort of use Sterling's formula to solve this recursion relation. And then you can show beautifully that the, that the, that the probability of a, of a representation, which is an M and N representation, because it's SU3 is characterized by two variables, uh, just like ones and zeros, zeros and ones, after K steps can be written in this form here. Okay, where this D2 is a quadratic Casimir in QCD, which has this form in terms of M's and N's, and D3 is a cubic Casimir of QCD. Okay. So these are all well-known 
uh, in the literature. And so when you construct this random walk, when you're multiplying all these different quark states and constructing your path integral, so then it's actually, it's an it's a integral over all these m's and n's with some weight of a given representation, which is dmn, times the multiplicity of the representation. So it's a weight times a multiplicity integrated over the phase space, if you like, where the dimension is given by this quantity here. Turns out that you can write this exactly Okay, in the limit of large k as an eight-dimensional integral over color charge times these weights, which are this quadratic and cubic Casimirs that I had here. Where this object, the m, so you can really think of SU3 as having sort of eight degrees of freedom, where the m's and n's are two of them, which control the, the length of the, the, uh, the object. And then, so think of as some kind of a many-body, many-dimensional sphere, where the, the size of the sphere is controlled by two variables, okay? And then there are six angles, okay? Which are, and, and they're conjugates which characterize their, the sphere, and these are called Darboux variables, and you can actually calculate what these are. And it turns out if you put this together, okay, these two are exactly equivalent, okay? So the random walk problem gives you a path with your goal, which is exactly this, which the limit of large A. And so, again, now if I'm constructing this effective theory, okay, uh, I'm writing down my path integral and I'm working the large A limit, right? It turns out that for, if you go to very large A, my K is very large. I live in a higher dimensional representation of the algebra, okay? Because my random walk takes me to a very large representation where the colors commute with each other. Okay? And you can actually construct this weight functional that I talked about earlier, the statistical weight, you can actually compute. Okay. That's, that's, these, that's this, this cubic, this quadratic and cubic Casimir, which you can then rewrite in this fashion here. These are the two invariants in SU3, okay? This is the quadratic and cubic Casimir in QCD. And it turns out that these if people are familiar with the language of Pomerons and Audrons and so on, QCD, these naturally give an interpretation of these complex ob objects in just simple group theory. Okay. So if you, if you compute, say, some diffractive scattering, right, this will automatically pick out the Pomeron state. Okay? It will project out the Pomeron state, the theory. So, but the other thing that happens when you write down this weight, which is remarkable, is that you get automatically a dimensionful scale, okay? This dimensionful scale is basically the number of quarks in this box that you, per unit area, in this box that you resolved, okay, by the probe. So it's a number of valence quarks per unit area times the size of this box, okay? And so this object is, proportional to the color charge squared that the probe. Remember, it's a random walk, right? So on average, you'll see zero color, but you'll see fluctuations of color which are large, right? The weight of that fluctuations is this dimension full scale, okay, mu squared in the theory. So I have a path integral now, okay, where I have a scale emerge, in the large A limit, okay? And if this scale is large, which it is because it's proportional to a to the one third. Okay, this scale is proportional to a to the one third. The number of quarks I'm coupling to, right? The size of the nucleus. Then the coupling will be weak. Okay? So the coupling will run as a function of the scale. Yeah. Sorry. Can we get the order on from the random walk analysis? That, yes. Okay. In fact, I, I have a paper with uh, with John where we actually computed uh, the order on in, in, uh, using this term, uh, and it's you can really it has a simple interpretation as just colorless three gluon exchange. And how would it scale with a? Uh, so it scales as uh, it's a weaker scaling. It scales as um, a to the one sixth. Or uh, it's it's a very weak scaling, actually. Um, actually, it's even weaker. I don't remember, but it's it's a very weak scaling. But you can actually extract the scale. I just don't offhand remember. Uh, 
So, so this is really suppressed compared to this term. That's the point. Um, so, so in this limit of a very large nucleus, I've seen that the high energy limit of QCD, right, for very large A, gives you the description of this many body system of gluons as a two dimensional strongly correlated theory of gluons where I can compute all n body correlations in weak coupling. And that's the color glass condensate. Now, you can say, oh, but this is a very large nucleus, right? What does it tell us about the real world? Okay. So first of all, it's always good, as my friend Rob Pizarski says, that it's always good to work in some limit where things are well understood. Okay? Um, I, he may not mean it in this context, but more generally, uh, that's, that's something I take very much to heart. Uh, so, so, I, so now, but you can, but you can ask, you know, reasonably, does this apply for actual physics, okay? Uh, and the answer is it does, but I'm kind of running out of time, so I don't really know um, where I should stop. How much, I've gone way over, right? Actually, in my watch, it's not that much, but. Okay. So, so can I go on for 10 minutes and then you can ask me questions along the way? <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> okay, so that's including the questions. Okay, so I should, so you're telling me I should stop. Okay. Okay. But the questions could be about the slides that come, right? Like you could ask me, you could ask me a question, like how do you extend this to a finite nucleus? <laughs> okay, so, so, so let me, let me uh, say Rob is, no, they, they, no, certainly you should ask questions. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. I didn't scare them, you scared them. <laughs> So he's eating up the time now. No, I'll just shout. So, <laughs> okay, so the question I have, if you go to very small x, right, mm -hmm. does it mean somehow? Means somehow? Ah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Means somehow that, uh, I mean, the gluon you actually have has an, has an incredibly long wavelength somehow, right? And so, so the one thing that's always been bugging me is like, okay, if you have this incredibly long wavelength gluon, right, don't you at some point hit scales which which you know where confinement phenomena are so become important, right? If you if you really go to the, to, to some of the strict limit where x goes to zero, I mean, is there is there anything to worry there, or is there so, so is this there simply a to wrong next intuition? Slide. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. It it did bring me to my next slide. Okay, and actually, this is uh, so what what uh, Zorn asks is a very reasonable question, uh, and this is often um, what people asked me about, uh, but it's a misunderstanding, okay? Uh, and the misunderstanding is the fact that, so, so look, at, look at the nucleus as being this object here, right? So this is my Lorentz contracted nucleus, and it has some fields around the nucleus, right? Now, outside the nucleus, right, the nucleus carries absolutely no field strength, okay? So either the gauge fields are strictly zero, or they are what's called pure gauges, okay? So they carry zero field strength. So, so we know that gauge fields in themselves are not physical in QCD, but field strengths are, right? So electric and magnetic fields are what's physical. All the electric and magnetic fields live entirely on the sheet, okay? So even though you have small x modes, which may be very long wavelength, they have support in terms of electric and magnetic field only inside this, this small Lorentz contracted width. The picture is actually more complex, right? When you include renormalization group evolution, which is in the next slides, okay? Then it turns out that the nucleus so I have this Lorentz contracted nucleus, right? And so this is say where the valence quarks sit and all the field strength is just peaked right here, 
Okay? So it's like a delta function. X minus. So this is x minus is equal to zero is, is this width here roughly. So now what happens is that when you have renormalization group evolution, when you emit more and more gluons, this gets a certain fuzziness. Okay? And this fuzziness widens the range of field strength, okay? And I'm, I'm not cheating, but I really do want to show you a figure which will address Zorin's question uh, explicitly. So, so that's this thing here. So here is the distribution of field strength in a nucleus, okay? So the valence partons sit in some region which is 2R over gamma, right? That's the diameter of the nucleus divided by the gamma factor by which it's boosted. So think you're always working in this infinite momentum frame where the nucleus is moving very fast, okay? So the fuzz of gluons, okay? The small x gluons which carry field strength can extend now outside this R over gamma, but it can only extend up to one over lambda QCD. Once you go beyond lambda QCD, there will be no field strength. In fact, the reality is contrary to your naive intuition about small x, in the sense that the, this, this distribution shrinks as you go to higher and higher energies, okay? So if you look at this V part on width, it's one over lambda QCD parametrically times e to the minus delta y over two. Okay, where delta y is the separation between the, uh, between the rapidity of the valence partons and the V partons, okay? And this is Lorentz invariant, okay? It's a difference between rapidities. So as you go to higher and higher energies, the, the, the field strength that's being carried, okay, the fuzz of V partons becomes narrower and narrower, and it's basically one over QS. Okay, so what I just wrote down here is one over QS. And so this is also a problem that people make, and I'm going to discuss this when they start thinking about heavy iron collisions. When two heavy ions collide, the time scale for the heavy ions to cross each other even, okay, is not 2R or gamma, okay, or, or, or one over that, right? So, uh, sorry, it's, it's, not a time, it's, it's not 2R or gamma, right, sorry but it's on the order of one over QS, okay, or two over QS. That's the time even for these fuzz field strengths to completely kind of really decohere and sort of also just overlap with, with each other. I don't know if I addressed your question, but. I mean, if that were not true, this whole picture is invalid, huh? Ah, ah, very, very good question. So, so this is entirely a weak coupling picture, right? So we are talking about partons which typically have transverse. So one has to really think about this as a distribution of partons which have transverse momentum on the order of QS and some longitudinal momentum distribution, okay? So if I'm writing down a distribution function uh, in, in F, of uh, say PT and um, X, right? Then this is, this is saying that this has some distribution. So these partons, what I'm describing is a distribution of partons with a PT on the order of QS, okay? And, and in X. And so once I go to low momentum scales, right? This whole picture breaks down. So you can have very low momentum partons or fields which are, you know, spread out all the way up to lambda QCD. And so when you, but again, they're very low momentum, right? So if you're interested in, in the radial limit of scattering, where QS is very, very large, right? Then these low momentum partons are not really contributing a lot to the cross section, okay? In fact, that brings me to my next slide. Um, let me draw, show you this one slide here, right? So this is the picture in transverse momentum, right? As you increase QS, the typical transverse momentum of the partons is getting larger and larger, and it's only tails that are sitting here at lambda QCD, 
right? So at sufficiently large uh, high energies, except for total cross sections, okay? Total cross sections is a problem which we can discuss separately, but for any kind of process that's sensitive to momentum, okay, or what you're measuring, then the claim is that it'll be controlled by this physics at very large QS. Yeah, but, but, the, but the thing is that, but the, no, no, but again, you, you are going to see, it's, again, it's a distribution that yeah. you're probing, right? And the, the, but this is, you know, if you're looking, so the guys that are giving that dipole a kick, so think of it the following way, right? The dipole may be getting very soft stuff, PT exchanges of lambda QCD all the way through its interaction with the proton, right? But it's going to get hard kicks only in some narrow region around the Lorentz contracted width, okay? That's the way to see it. So I have my dipole, right? So I have my dipole, right? And that's coming in, okay? And it's carrying off the proton, which is you can think of as this Lorentz contracted object. So what I'm saying is that suppose the the width, so say this is lambda QCD, right? Or one over lambda QCD. The dipole may have lots of soft exchanges all the way, you know, in, in its interaction up to a distance scale lambda QCD, but it's going to get these hard QS kicks only in some region around the Lorentz contracted width, which is given by this the scale, one over QS. So, you know, but these are parametrically much smaller. Right? So if you're in a Ray J limit, then you can ignore that. I mean, if you're thinking, you know, really asymptotics, right, it's irrelevant. I, I mean, I'd be happy to hear a counterexample. Yeah, so. But I mean, it's a, it's a very non-trivial question. It's, 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 a que it's a question which some of my senior collaborators are a little confused about occasionally. Uh, so, so I have a similar kind yeah. of question. So I think, uh, can I also see this uh, picture in, a, in this way, that you have a fixed Q square, and you are evolving in X, and there is some kind of a cutoff uh, in X, uh, beyond which you say X greater than XC are the things that are contributing to the sources, which is in W, and the small X uh, are X less than XC, that cutoff. And this Q square is fixed as Q square at, at that cutoff, XC, which is small, and that's why it's, you're seeing weak coupling physics. That, uh, right, right, I mean, in the sense that, remember, I was saying that if I, again, you know, if I again draw this jelly bean picture, right, so imagine you have a you have a scale set by your your probe, right? Your deep elastic scattering, your Hera Q squared, right? You fix some Q squared, and so the probe starts out at some scale, just resolving things from the size of that Q squared, right? But now I boost the proton, so all I fix is Q squared, okay? But now I change x. I have two variables to play with, okay? So I fix Q squared and I now play with X. So what happens when I go to change X? I emit gluons with some smaller X, right? And I can imagine this being emitted here, right? So I start having more and more gluons as I go to smaller and smaller X. Now, because my Q squared was large, it will take me a longer time to fill up this thing, right? If my Q squared was small, right? If I had a big guy, right? Then I, in my, here I would be resolving big guys, right? And then with X evolution, I would quickly overlap. Right, so for this Q squared, the X at which I would get close packing, right, would be smaller. I mean, would be larger, excuse me. At a larger X for a small Q squared, I would get close packing. Conversely here. Right, because if I have a small Q squared, I need to go a long ways in X, right? I need to decrease X by a lot for it to start close packing. I mean, you, I, this weak coupling picture will break down if Q squared so, becomes small. 
So my statement is that at arbitrarily high Q squared, fix your Q squared. Suppose you have, you know, a 10 TV scale DIS collider, okay? And you could have Q squared of 100, okay? For very large Q squared, right? I have a Q squared of 100, and I go to X of 10 to the minus 9. Okay? My claim is that then you will have saturation. Okay? So, it's, so at any Q squared, there is an X at which you will have saturation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. This whole thing breaks down. And that was the problem I mentioned with Hera, right? With Hera, I mean, all of this stuff seems to work, right? But the saturation scales that you extract, kind of, they seem small, right? So you don't really trust the self-consistency of this picture. It seems to be precocious. It works better than it should. Now, you can have two minds about that. You can declare a victory, right? Which a lot of people tend to do, right? I mean, a lot of perturbative QC guys, when it, something fits the data, say, oh, this is victory. This perturbative QC works, right? But, you know, or you can say, hmm, it works, but I don't really, you know, trust it. So things sometimes work precociously, and it may be accidental, you know, so. But I have to say that the description of these dipole model fits to the small x data, they simultaneously describe the diffractive, exclusive, uh, you know, inclusive, FL, all of that, okay, with a small number of parameters, okay? And so you can say, well, you know, okay, you know, it's, it's you're getting a small QS, um, but it, it works much better than you would naively expect it to. But again, one has to do higher order computations in this framework. Um, and a lot of these are leading order kind of computations. So in this weak coupling picture, you have to do higher order computations. Uh, and Kaushik is going to talk about how one does it in the Regi limit. Okay? Um, so in 20 minutes, he'll tell you all about higher order computations. And, okay, yeah. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. About there were some other questions there. Okay, so also, but yeah. Okay. You don't understand what is a QS. You understand from particular value of X, you have saturation for a given Q square. Right. So that is that scale, right? So what I'm saying is that think of it the following way, okay? So, so think of, exactly. So think of it the following way. So here I have Q squared, okay? Here I have 1 over X. So I can draw a line where Q, okay, this is, this is a Q squared, okay, at, so beyond the scale, right, I have saturation. So this is 1 over X, okay, so here I have saturation. In, in other words, my phase space occupancies of gluons are becoming on the order of 1 over alpha S. So my evolution equations become intrinsically nonlinear at this place here. I didn't get a chance to discuss this, but there's a renormalization group equation called the bolsky kovchigov equation, for example, where you see explicitly, right, the scale at which this becomes nonlinear, okay? In other words, I can write down, so think about my forward scattering amplitude, okay? as a function of, say, rapidity. Okay, this is equal to something, some kernel, which I call BFKL, okay, times n minus n squared. This is, at low occupancies, I get the BFKL equation. At high occupancies, these become of the same order, when n is on the order of 1, right? So th there's a fixed point to this evolution which occurs at n equal to 1, not just n equal to 0. Okay? And this is intrinsically nonlinear. And this equation self-consistently allows you to extract a saturation scale, okay? which is the scale at which this object is parametrically of the order of this. 
And so that, that's the, you know, more microscopic. And one can start, you know, from this effective field theory, do RG, and actually explicitly do deep elastic scattering, current-current correlator, manifestly show that you obtain this. That was somehow something I couldn't really get to in my talk, so. Okay, uh, sorry, I think it's time to, to close the session. Well, there was one more question up there. <laughs> Okay. Maybe during the coffee break. So let's thank Raju for his lecture.